Okay, you are free to start. All right, thank you very much and uh, welcome to everyone to this uh, mini symposium on applications of coliant error estimation and adaptivity. Uh, I think it's now a classic. Uh, we'll have two sessions, the first one right now and the same, the next one on Wednesday at the same time. Uh, I put this picture because this is usually how I feel when I prepare my videos. And uh, I would like to thank uh, everyone to have prepared some uh, videos for this uh, mini symposium. So we have uh, six talks and I will present, introduce them uh, at the beginning of uh, each uh, video. Uh, we will, so we will have all the, the talks at the same, uh, one after the other. And then uh, we will proceed with the uh, questions and discussions. So for the questions, as you know, you can write uh, and prepare your questions uh, in, the, in, in the chat. Uh, for the discussion, uh, I propose two topics, but uh, you are welcome to bring other topics. And uh, first of all, I would like to know about major achievements in neuroestimation adaptivity in the last 10 years and eventually the challenges uh, for the coming years. Of course, those are suggestions and uh, you are all uh, welcome to uh, participate to the discussion. Uh, the first talk then is going to be uh, by Felipe Caro and it's going to be on goal-oriented HP adaptive finite element methods, a painless multi-level automatic coarsening strategy. So you can, uh, I'm going to stop uh, sharing and the video I think will come very soon. Hello, my name is Felipe Caro and I'm a PhD student. I'm going to talk about goal-oriented HP adaptive strategy. The main components in our approach are on one hand, data structures and on the other, an automatic adaptive strategy. The main idea is to extend the word of diagram to the context of goal-oriented problem. We use the multi-level approach of Sander. This method reduces the complexity of hanging out using direct click nodes. The adaptive process iterates along two steps. First, for a given HP grid, we perform a global and uniform refinement step, and then we perform a HP refinement step. Here, to illustrate the process, we use a solution with a boundary layer. On the left, we have the meshes, and on the right, we have the evolution of the relative error. The unrefinement process iterates along four steps. Solve, compute, mark, and remove. Here, I'm going to describe the general idea of our goal-oriented approach. We introduce our finite element space and we describe the problems to be solved in our rational formulation. On one hand, we have the forward problem, and on the other, we have the adjoint problem. We introduce a big hat, such that big hat is an upper bound of the absolute value of P, the bilinear form. Using the dual form, we obtain an upper bound of the representation of the error in the quantity of interest. Here, E is a small portion of the basis functions. The idea is to remove all those basis functions whose contribution to the solution is the lowest. Here, we have a problem based on the Laplace equation. This problem is in the context of goal-oriented and its solution 
is a function called the peak function. We observe the solution of the forward problem on the left and we observe the solution on the object problem on the right. Here, the final adaptive HP mesh and the evolution of the error in the quantity of interest. Now, I'm going to present to you a problem based on the Helmholtz equation. We observe the VH and the domain. On the left, we observe the solution of the forward problem and on the right, the solution of the adjoint problem. Here, the final adaptive mesh and again, the evolution of the relative error in the quantity of interest. Future work. The future work is mainly devoted to the extension to multi-physics problems and to applications to geophysics. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Felipe, for a very nice uh, presentation. So now we, uh, so as I said earlier, we are going to keep the questions for the end. And now we are going to have the second presentation given by uh, Frédéric uh, Legol on certified computations with PGD model reductions in the MS FEM framework. Morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Frédéric Legol, and I'm going to present a joint work with Ludovic Chamois. I would like to thank uh, Serge Prudhomme for his uh, kind invitation uh, to this Mono Symposium, and I'm going to talk about a work uh, about MSFM and the use of PGD model reduction within uh, its framework. Uh, we are interested in this work in multi-scale problem, which are ubiquitous in the aircraft industry, or in the mechanics simulation. And so we'll be uh, focused on this equation minus divergence A epsilon grad U epsilon is equal to F, where the coefficient A epsilon oscillate at a very small scale epsilon. This makes the problem uh, difficult and untractable with classical finite element. And for this, we are going to use the multi-scale finite element method, which is a dedicated method for multi-scale problems. It's based on the variational formulation of the problem, A epsilon of U epsilon V is equal to B of V. And the idea of the method is to not work with the standard finite element basis functions, but to work with suitably chosen basis functions, which are going to be pre-computed and that will encode uh, the microstructure features defined by A epsilon. This will be the expensive part of the uh, procedure, but it will be independent of the load and thus done in the offline stage. In the online stage, we will solve a Galakian approximation, uh, which would be completely inexpensive. So the idea is to give ourselves a coarse mesh with the size of the mesh capital H much larger than the heterogeneity is to give ourselves classical P1 finite element basis function phi I naught. And then on each element of the coarse mesh to consider this problem, this equilibrium problem minus the divergence A epsilon grad phi epsilon is equal to zero with some uh, boundary condition. And so to define uh, the basis function as a solution to these local problems. And uh, so because they encode the epsilon in their definition, they know the microstructure, and for instance, here the microstructure does not oscillate uh, similarly on the uh, left and on the right sides, and you see that the basis functions are not identical on the left and the right part of the medium. Once we have these basis functions, we uh, oscillate at the proper uh, frequency. We consider the standard Galakian approximation of the problem, and it is an inexpensive computation now because the number of these basis functions is equal to the number of nodes of the coarse mesh independently of epsilon. 
The problem we have worked with, uh, with uh, Ludovic is about the parameterized problem where now A epsilon depends on some mu. Uh, we can do the direct approach of the MSFM where for each new mu we would recompute the basis function. This is tremendously expensive. And so what we advocate is to use a PGD approach to uh, compute in the offline part the basis functions as the sum of products of terms that depend on x times functions that depends on mu. This is pre-computed in the offline stage and once we have a new value of mu we will simply uh, compute or evaluate this quantity and not recompute it by solving a PD. Uh, so to test this we consider a simple problem where we have a, a epsilon depending on some mu and we consider we freeze the discretization and to do that, we use our previous works uh, to adapt, to properly adapt the discretization. I have shown here the PGD mode, and uh, we run the simulation with this. Here are the results for various values of mu, where we show the error on a specific quantity of interest, error of our approach compared to the exact solution or compared to the MSM solution. We, are, we see that we are doing a good job a, for a very much reduced cost. If you want to know more about this, I would welcome questions very warmly and I'm looking to, forward to see you uh, in AdMOOCs. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frédéric. A very nice presentation as well. And uh, we are going to proceed with the third talk by uh, Murad Fergoub. And it's going to be on model error estimation based on asymptotic homogenization for periodic heterogeneous structures. Here it comes. Hello, everyone. My name is Murad Fergoub, a PhD student at Mid Paris Tech with an industrial collaboration with Safran. In this presentation, I will mainly talk about how we can use the asymptotic homogenization method for periodic heterogeneous structures in order to estimate the modeling error. So in general, we distinguish two sources of error while conducting FEM simulations. The first one is the modeling error, and the second one is the discretization error. In our work, the modeling error quantified the difference between the solution of the heterogeneous problem and the localized problem resulting from the asymptotic homogenization method. In this work, we will assume that the quality of the discretization is sufficiently good so that the difference of the solution could be attributed to the modeling error. Our aim is then to estimate the proximity of the localized problem to the heterogeneous one, and this information can be used to steer the process of adaptivity. Let's then talk about the asymptotic homogenization method for periodic structures. So we consider the following problem and the stress fields will be plotted over the red line. We see that the localized stress is correct in the inner domain of the structure. Nevertheless, accuracy is lost near the sliding boundary and near the Neumann boundary. Indeed, we see that higher stresses are developed in uh, boundary regions which actually can be responsible of the failure of the composite structures. This also can be seen in this error map representing the modeling error between the heterogeneous fields and the localized fields in this energy norm. We see that the error is maximal on the edges and uh, low in the inner domain of the structure. We have proposed a general boundary layer correction methodology in order to approximate real heterogeneous fields for different boundary, boundary conditions. The obtained results demonstrate the significance of the proposed boundary layer correction. And as you can see here, the localized field is very similar to the heterogeneous one. And also here, the Neumann boundary condition is verified. This is also the case for this error map here where uh, the error is uh, very low even on the edges. We know now that the composite uh, structure is subjected to a bending as shown in this figure and uh, actually this creates high gradients of the macroscopic strain field 
and in this case the first order approximation is expected to lose its accuracy even in the inner domain of the structure this can be seen actually in this uh, stress fields plotted over the red line where the first order approximation is very different than the heterogeneous one and it is also the case for the stress fields plotted over the blue line and actually to tackle this uh, it is necessary to consider higher order terms in the asymptotic homogenization, which actually introduce successive gradients of the macroscale strain and tensor characteristic of the microstructure. And we have actually computed the second order homogenization problem. And now we see that we obtain a sufficiently good uh, approximation in the inner domain of the structure and also near the boundaries, as you can see here and here. But uh, please note that um, uh, we have actually proposed a, a, a general boundary layer correction up to the second order, which is actually a continuity of what I have presented before. Let's then try to estimate the modeling error. We have proposed a modeling error estimation written as follows, uh, which actually uh, quantified the difference between fields obtained from the second order homogenization uh, method uh, corrected on the borders with the first order homogenization without any correction. Actually, our aim is to quantify the terms neglected um, in the asymptotic uh, homogenization uh, with, of course, uh, the error on the, on the edges. We shall consider now the following, the following problem where the high gradients of the macroscopic strain fields exist. The modeling error estimation is presented in this error map where we can see actually that the maximum of the modeling error is uh, near the, the boundaries and uh, also we uh, can see the existence of some modeling error in the inner domain of the structure. By comparing now the reference modeling error on the left with our estimation on the right, we conclude that we have a similar elementary contribution to the modeling error. Uh, nevertheless, we have some overestimation of the modeling error near the corners of the perforation, and this is actually mainly due to the high singularities in these corners. We have proposed an estimation of the modeling error based on a second order localization and a boundary layer procedure up to the second order. And our future works are mainly to construct a modeling error estimation with um, the obtained field from uh, a third order homogenization and also to investigate the interaction and competition between the modeling error and the discretization error and lastly to steer uh, an adaptive modeling process based on the proposed um, modeling error estimation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much Mouad. The good thing about this format of the conference is like uh, we are perfect on time but uh, don't forget to um, ask questions in this chat. Uh, I've seen that already a few have uh, asked some questions, so that's good. Um, so the next uh, speaker is going to be Judith Munoz Matute, and she's going to talk about DPG-based time marching schemes for linear parabolic and hyperbolic PDEs. Hello. My name is Judith Muñoz, I'm a postdoc uh, researcher and today I'm going to talk about a work in collaboration with professors uh, Lesef Denkovic and David Pardo. So the idea of our work is based on the discontinuous petrov galerkin method introduced by professors Denkovic and Gopalakrishnan in 2010. So our idea is to apply this method to the time variable of transient PDEs in order to design a DPG-based time marching scheme. So I'm going to explain the general idea of the DPG method. So given a linear variational problem, a well-posed problem, we can uh, introduce the optimal test space by solving an auxiliary problem. So given a, a trial function, we are going to compute the corresponding optimal test function to inherit the stability of the continuous problem. So in general, we cannot uh, do this analytically. We, can, we need to approximate them, but uh, as we are only applying this method to a 1D problem, only in the time variable, 
we can compute the optimal test functions analytically. So uh, this is the model problem we are going to consider. Uh, it's a single ODE, but from here we can uh, extend it to general uh, transient partial differential equations by um, considering that this lambda here could be a matrix. So uh, we are going to introduce an ultra weak variational formulation, so we multiply by, by test functions and integrate by parts, and we introduce uh, an extra unknown for the trace. And this is the test, the test norm we are going to, to consider. So with this variational setting, we can uh, compute the optimal test functions analytically. And in this case, the optimal test functions are exponentials of this uh, matrix lambda. So then we substitute these uh, optimal test functions into the variational formulation, and we obtain uh, a time marching scheme based on on the discontinuous petrov working method. So uh, we know the trace value at uh, tk minus one, is in green here. Then with uh, the first equation, we can compute the trace at, uh, at time tk by this equation. And then we have uh, a system to compute the, the interior of the element. So, what we realize is that the first equation, the one corresponding to the traces, already existed. It's called a exponential integrator. And our contribution in, in these papers is that uh, it's showing the relation between the DPG method and exponential integrators. And additionally, we have a system to compute the interior uh, of the element. So um, I'm showing here some numerical results. This is a single ODE, a hyperbolic problem. So here we have the approximated solution for linear, uh, for piecewise constant, piecewise linear, uh, piecewise quadratic. So we can see here that that we can approximate really well the interior of the of the element. Uh, we have optimal rate of convergence. Uh, here we have uh, one D plus a time example, a wave equation, also for a constants, linear sign and quadratic. We also have an optimal rate of convergence, but in this case, the, the approximation in, in a space is fixed by the buff novokalergi method, so the convergence at some point stabilizes. And we also can solve to the plus time uh, wave equations. We also have um, solutions for parabolic uh, problems as well. And now we, there are a lot of things we can do with this because uh, we know that the DPG method uh, comes uh, with a built-in error representation function, so we can use this error representation for, for uh, doing adaptivity. So we have in mind um, design space-time adaptive processes, goal-oriented adaptivity, uh, we are also working now on how to combine both DPG base time, a time marching scheme together with a DPG in space. And also it could be interesting to extend this method to, to nonlinear uh, transient problems. And that's it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Judith. I, will, I may have a question for you later. And uh, well, the next speaker is uh, going to be myself. And uh, it's going to be a very simple presentation. And I will talk about computational analysis of goal oriented adaptive strategies based on several error representations. Of course, it's going to be with uh, several uh, collaborators. Hi, the topic of this uh, presentation deals with the efficiency of adaptive methods for the solution of boundary value problems and the approximation of quantities of interest by the finite element method. First, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators, Jan Guignard, Vincent Darigon, Kenan Kergren, Jonathan Vacher, and Vicenzo Iannuzzi. There exists a vast literature, though this is by no means exhaustive, on the convergence and optimality of adaptive methods with respect to global norms or quantities of interest. Most of the works are, however, concerned with the Poisson problem, 
except maybe the last reference, which extends the previous works to the general second order elliptic problems. My goal here is to discuss about a few challenges, and I think I will raise more questions than provide answers. I'm going to consider the simple 1D convection diffusion problem given here. Uh, first, we know that this problem can actually be transformed into a pure Poisson problem using this integrating factor. Alternatively, one can reduce the convection diffusion equation into the simple Laplace equation by a change of variable shown here. Can we use this information to generate optimal meshes? Our goal was to define transformations in order to map a uniform mesh into a non-uniform mesh. We have imagined several options, one based on the integration factor shown in cyan, one based on the transformation that gives the Laplace equation shown in blue, a combination of those two shown in magenta, and finally a pseudo-adapted mesh where we iteratively refine only, in the, element, only the element to the right doing so eight times and proceed with uniform refinement. This gives the transformation shown in black. We also provide the convergence plots here with respect to the H1 norm using these transformations. Uniform meshes give the largest errors as expected. The combined transformation the smallest The blue curve does not have the proper convergence rate, and the adaptive method provides results in between. The transformation based on the integration factor failed here as the elements within the boundary layer were too small. We note that the performance of these uh, methods changes when we consider the L2 norm or equality of interest. Of course, the optimality of the mesh will depend on the goal, but I emphasize here that it is not easy to determine an optimal mesh, one that gives the smallest error for a given number of degrees of freedom, even in this simple case. Another point I would like to make concerns the choice of the norm. I show here some classical norms, the H1 norms or so-called energy norms. However, we can also consider the last norm based on the integration factor, which was uh, suggested by Brezis in his book on functional analysis. In fact, this figure shows that the use of the last norm provides the best result when we do error estimation and mesh adaptation with respect to the global norms. Note that the other four norms provide here similar results. We now review the basic principles for goal-oriented error estimation. We consider a problem in week 4, basically our boundary layer problem, and its finite element discretization. We know that the error in the linear functional Q can be expressed as a product of the residual R and the solution Z to the adjoint problem. This is one example. In fact, we can consider additional representations by introducing the Ritz representer associated with this uh, residual. Also, for adaptation purposes, the global quantity can be decomposed into local contributions in several ways. Moreover, I show here the so-called maximum strategy for adaptation but we could consider also other marking strategies. Without going into details, I show here the convergence of the error in a quantity of interest after several adaptive iterations when we consider different options. All provide different adaptive meshes, some provide better results than others. And, uh, however, the results are very uh, different when we change epsilon to a smaller value, in which case the boundary layer is much thinner. It is therefore difficult to conclude which method is in fact the best. 
In conclusion, the message that I would like to convey is that the performance of an adaptive method depend on several factors essentially listed here. Not easy then to identify an approach that would produce optimal meshes. Thank you for listening. Well, this is always strange to listen uh, to myself. Um, so we are going to proceed with the last uh, presentation for this uh, session, and it's going to be given by uh, Chris van der Zee, and he's going to talk about data-driven goal-oriented finite element methods and machine learning minimal residual framework. Hi, my name is uh, Chris van der Zee, and in this talk, I'm going to explain to you how machine learning can be used to develop superior goal-oriented viscularizations. And uh, this work is joined with Ignacio Brevis and Ignacio Muga from PUCV. Essentially, we've got a publication, the reference of which you can find below. Uh, let me go to the central problem at hand. Okay, here it is. So the central problem is that we want to find a method. Okay, a method for what problem? Uh, a linear operator equation B equals F. And obviously that can come from, you know, your, your favorite variational formula, formulation at the continuous level. And we assume that U is part of a uh, Hilbert space capital U. Okay, and we want to find a method for this standard problem such that for a fixed UH, a discrete subspace, the method delivers the optimal approximation in this discrete subspace. Okay, and what do I mean with optimal? Optimal as measured by a quantity of interest, a linear functional, so that when you compare the uh, the true output q of u to the output delivered by the method okay q of uh we want that this is minimized minimized among what well amongst all possible methods so let me go to a one demotivating example okay and this example um is inspired based on discussions I had with Serge Proudhon many, many years ago, before machine learning was part of the finite element community. It's just a one-dimensional problem, but it's uh, driven by a Dirac delta located at x equals lambda. The exact solution for this problem is simply given by this line that I draw here. And it has a kink at x equals lambda. Now, if you use Galerkin on this problem, Galerkin with a single element, you get an approximation that is that one. And if you've got a quantity of interest sitting, for example, here, I mean, I'm interested in the, the solution at x naught, you see that we make an order one error. And that's to be expected because we're using a coarse grid with a basic method. However, the discrete subspace that we have is a linear on a single element. And actually there is an approximation, which is that one, that is exact for the quantity, right? It has exactly the same value as the solution. The question is, Galerkin is not optimal, but what method is optimal? And uh, we want to have a method that would be optimal uniformly in lambda. So I want to have a method designed for this parametric partial differential equation. All right. The key idea is to use data to train a goal-oriented discretization method. And what do I mean by that? I mean that, that there are two essential steps here. We need to define a family of methods and then find amongst this entire family which method is optimal. Okay. We are going to introduce what we think is the right family, which is a petrov golurkin family with parameters theta in there. So for every choice of parameters theta, we define a new test space. In fact, we're going to define this test space to be the inverse of the Ries map for the test space V with a weight omega parameterized by theta applied to operator B applied to UH. Okay. And this is now a parametric family of petrov methods. Okay. Now, what I mean by a, an inverse of a Ries map that is based, say, on a weighted inner product, for example, the weighted grad u grad v inner product. Okay. 
Now, how do we find the optimal method amongst this family? We're going to use ideas from machine learning. So step two, we're going to say that our weight function at a particular point x to be the exponent of an artificial neural network that has parameters theta evaluated for x. And what are we supposed to achieve? Well, we want to minimize now amongst all theta. So here we are assuming that we've got available some data value. So this is the available data. Uh, and we basically vary theta to find the minimum of this cost function. Okay, and thereby we are essentially training the neural network. Once we have trained the neural network, we found the optimal method, and that means we can apply it for any other lambda that we are interested in. If you want to see some numerical results, have a look into the paper. Uh, they, the results are absolutely striking with only very few data points you obtain highly accurate quantities. So the method that is trained in that way is absolutely superior. Thank you, Chris, for a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, I liked it. So uh, that's con that concludes uh, all presentations for this, uh, for this session. And now we are going to proceed with uh, the, the, the several uh, questions that we had. Uh, you may ask, uh, you can still ask more questions, but I'm going to, to proceed in order. Uh, so the first question is going to be to Frederic. And Frederic, I'm going to ask you maybe to uh, turn on your camera and your hey. mic. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. afternoon. <laughs> good, for, good morning <laughs> for me. Good morning, uh, so the I'm sure you saw the question. So the first question uh, basically is by uh, Manisha Shetri. And uh, the question is, you mentioned that the solution is based on the coarse mesh model, but will it not have additional FP discretization error? Um, that's a nice uh, question. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe I can share my screen and see a slide. Um, can you show, show a slide? Can you see this one? Yes, we do. Oh, okay. Um, so here, that's a picture of the of the basis function. So the, uh, that's uh, in one D, of course, obviously on the picture. The mesh is coarse in the sense that there are only five elements along the complete domain, but the uh, basis functions that we are using are not the standard finite element basis functions. They are adapted to the oscillations of the problem. And uh, because they are adapted, uh, this is why we think that we can use so few degrees of freedom, even though the problem is uh, oscillatory. Uh, uh, but uh, it is completely true that uh, in the end, whatever we do, there, there remains a discretization error and so what we, uh, the, the way we design our mesh is that we uh, use our, uh, the development of uh, a posteriori error estimator on uh, multi-scale problems and to compute this kind of mesh here, which result in uh, uh, finding, um, adapting the mesh such that the error uh, in, uh, in, uh, in norm, in energy norm, on the solution is uh, below uh, a certain threshold. So there are two parts in my, in my answer. One, uh, the bases are oscillatory and two, the, the mesh is adapted. Thank you. Thank you, Frédéric, for sure. the answer. Uh, I have a second question and this time it's going to be for Felipe. Uh, how does the unrefinement algorithm include dual or adjoint information? So Felipe, if you can turn on your camera and your mic. Hello, uh, good, good morning. Good morning in Canada, good afternoon in Europe. <laughs> uh, uh, well, the, thank you for the question. Um, let me see how to share my screen. Uh, uh, 
Oh, I cannot share. I think you should be able. Okay. okay, that's right. Here, uh, the question was about the uh, how does the refinement algorithm include uh, Android information? Well, we have um, our problem. We are looking uh, the direct, uh, the uh, we are willing to find the solution of a direct direct problem and a, a joint problem. And we observe the UNF as the solution of the problems. So, um, uh, here we include the information and the error indicator. We take uh, into account the part of the direct problem and the adjoint problem uh, in order to, to guide the unrefined step. We take uh, into account uh, both solutions here, the direct and the. Uh, I know if, if it is clear or, or not, but we have a, we are, a, we look for a, a suitable space to project our solution uh, such that this uh, final element space is, is, has minimum dimension. So we are trying to express the, to, to minimize the error in the quantity of interest projecting uh, our solutions uh, in a space with minimum dimension. I, I, hope is, I hope this is clear or if not, uh, let me know, please. Okay, so thanks. Thanks to Felipe. Chris uh, confirms that uh, you answer this question. So I have now, thank you very much. And uh, now Thank I have you. two two questions uh, for uh, Muad. Let me find them. Uh, so the first one is uh, from Frederick Larson, and the question is: May I ask you to elaborate on how you identify the resolved localized solution to the homogenized problem in order to compare it pointwise to the conventional DNS? Okay. So Muad, Thank yes. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Larson, for your question. I will share my screen to answer this question. Okay. So um, I propose this uh, figure in order to, uh, to explain uh, your question. So uh, let's start by this uh, heterogeneous structure. This is my intractable problem. Uh, so I identify a unit cell. Uh, which is uh, repeated in the three dimension space uh, in order to construct this, uh, this uh, structure, right? And uh, by uh, asymptotic homogenization method, I can uh, uh, obtain some localization tensor. Uh, for instance, this uh, strain localization tensor A here, uh, and B is like uh, the stressed localization tensors, which, which are uh, fourth order uh, tensor. And D is like the displacement uh, localization tensor. So uh, after that, I will uh, locate each uh, cell on the macrostructure. And uh, uh, after that, I can uh, estimate my uh, heterogeneous fields uh, by using this uh, localize, localization strong, uh, tensors and uh, the, the macro scale strain field. And by doing so, I can obtain this uh, estimation uh, fields. And uh, please note here that um, I, cons the, I consider that the macro scale and the micro scale structures are both uh, using the same, uh, the same mesh in order to, to delete uh, the or in order to neglect, neglect the, the discretization error. But uh, our, uh, 
ongoing work is like to to consider like different uh, discretization for the both uh, both structures um, and that's uh, how i uh, i obtained these uh, localization uh, fields and this is like for a, a first order homogenization uh, scheme and for the second uh, homogenization uh, scheme uh, we will uh, obtain uh, a second order localization tensors like uh, 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 which are now will be uh, fifth order uh, tensors, uh, uh, which we will uh, uh, multiply by the, the gradient of the strain field in order to, to estimate the localization. Uh, I mean, in order to estimate uh, heterogeneous fields uh, up to the second order. Um, so that's my answer for, for your question, Professor Larson. Uh, I hope it was clear for you. And uh, maybe so can... I'm, then yes. I'm going to ask the, the, the second. Thank you, um, Waden. I have a second question actually for you. Let me find it. Uh, OK, this time it's uh, from uh, Frédéric Legol. And uh, can you please discuss the cost to compute the boundary layer corrections? Uh, for example, in this problem, to compute the boundary layer correction, are the coefficients oscillatory? On which domain is the problem posed? Okay, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Frédéric Lecol, for for your uh, for your question. And I propose to you this uh, figure also in order to answer your question. So this is also for uh, a first order homogenization uh, scheme. Okay, and uh, we will suppose. I mean we suppose that the, the, the localization fields are correct in the inner domain of the structure, right? This uh, green uh, part of the structure. And in order to correct uh, these boundary layers here, uh, we will uh, consider uh, some auxiliary problems, which are uh, now conducted on uh, a unit cell, right? And uh, so these uh, auxiliary pro problems depend on, uh, they depend on the location of the the, the boundary uh, layer we want to correct, for instance, if, uh, uh, the, the, yes, the, the red cell here, the re red unit cell is uh, subjected to a directly uh, boundary. So we will uh, consider uh, an auxiliary problem where we, where, where we will apply some uh, specific uh, a specific uh, displacement field here in order to uh, uh, in order to obtain this uh, localization tensors uh, uh, which are like boundary layer tensors uh, and by multiplying these uh, tensors by the, the 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 strain macro scale strain field we will obtain this uh, boundary layer uh, correctors which we will add to the estimation of the the, uh, the heterogeneous fields, and this uh, this uh, corrected fields are supposed to verify the boundary layers. So, uh, as you can see, it's uh, some auxiliary problems conducted over one unit cell, uh, which depend on the location of the the, the boundary we want to correct and uh, uh, which is uh, not uh, computationally, uh, uh, which is uh, computationally acceptable, right? In uh, in order to correct these boundaries, and that's my answer for you, uh, Professor Frederic Lecol. I hope it Thank was you clear. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Uh, for your question, sorry. <laughs> well, thank you for your answer, and. Um, I'm going to uh, continue with the questions uh, the, for Chris. Um, let me find them. All right, so I'm going to have two questions for you, Chris. The first one is from uh, Frédéric Larson. In view of the limitations in extrapolation with uh, ANN, can you comment on the robustness and requirement on data points? 
Yes, uh, let me comment on that. Thank you, Frederick. That's a very nice uh, question. Uh, actually, I agree with you that um, uh, you can't really extrapolate. So, so what we have done is we have put the lambdas basically uniformly, uh, as I'm not sure if you can see the whiteboard, but basically uniformly on the on the on the domain of interest. Nine nine data points, for example, uh, that that gives you a, a certain level for all other lambdas. So you, you, the lambdas are indicated are the ones you assume you have the exact solution for, but then for all lambdas, you get a very nicely trained method. The level of accuracy you achieve depends of course on the amount of data you have. The more data you have available, the better the accuracy for arbitrary lambda. Okay, that's, that's a general observation. How, how much better, we don't really understand. It's an interesting, it's an interesting theoretical question that we don't really understand. Um, so uh, extrapolation, we haven't really tried because it doesn't seem natural for us to try it. So just put all the lambdas on one side and then expect to have a, a, a good method for a lambda that's sitting way over there. I, we haven't really tried it, but yeah, I, I'm not expecting it to work well. The, the other question um, was related. Oh, yes. So sorry, did you, ask, did you ask this other question already? No, 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 but uh, I okay. think you know it and uh, go ahead. Yeah, the other question was related to the um, the parametric PDE. So so we put the lambda here is, is sitting in the delta. It's a nonlinear dependence. You change lambda, you have a non you have a nonlinear change in the right hand side. If you make that a linear dependence, so you change lambda, the right hand side changes linearly. Then if you have data for varying lambda, the extra data doesn't, doesn't give you anything new. So uh, because the left hand solution changes in a linear way as well. So you don't get new information if you've got linearly varying a right hand sides. Uh, and actually, when you train your method for a linearly varying uh, data uh, or par parametric right hand side, then um, actually you can train it to be perfect, the method. So it's not an interesting situation. You want to have a parametric PDE where there is some nonlinear effect. Uh, more interesting is when the lambda is sitting in the operator. So when lambda is maybe the uh, coefficient of the uh, of the, the, the diffusion, for example. Uh, I, I didn't discuss that and uh, it's not in the paper because it's a significant more, it's a significant complication that we, we haven't done yet, but we are working on that. So um, does that, was that actually answering the question, Andreas? Apparently it did. Apparently, okay. Okay. He said, uh, thank you. So okay. I have a question actually for you. Okay. Uh, for your minimization problem, do you need to uh, add a regularization term or not? It's not necessary. Um, what kind of regularization? You, do you mean a regularization for the parameter theta, for example? For example, yes. Uh, we didn't do that. Uh, we used the black box optimizer actually. Okay. okay. So the, po the postdoc that was involved in this uh, project, he, he actually just used the optimizer in MATLAB. We didn't use a fancy optimizer. Uh, seems to work okay. Um, but so now then, then uh, this uh, so go ahead, yeah. A follow-up question actually. Uh, we know that when we try to, to find the neural network, right? may depend on the initial initialization. Yes. Uh, did you do something particular for the initialization of the neural network? So uh, let me tell you one thing. So we're trying to optimize a weight function. The weight function has to be a positive function. Otherwise you don't get a norm. So that's why I put an exponent there. We, we, we tested without an exponent. And then sometimes you get the parameters 
because they can be arbitrary, to give you a weight function that is also negative. And actually, you, you compute with a negative weight function. It, it, sometimes it does work. And it, it gives you very good it gives you a very good method but it, I, I would say it's, it's it's not a good method obviously so you want to have a positive weight function right uh, so i must say that um you run the optimizer twice with different initial conditions you get different weight functions uh, i know I mean, yeah. <laughs> not, not for your case but it happens also for the so you know, i mean problems yeah, so again, uh, it's definitely not unique, or in some sense, you don't, uh, practically you don't get to a unique uh, optimum method. You don't see that. So mm -hmm. you can have different optimum methods that give you a certain level of accuracy. Yeah, uh, I don't like that at all. But, but that's, why, that's why actually I was asking if uh, you, you needed maybe some uh, regularization terms to maybe uh, ensure that you get to a solution that you like. Yeah, I think that's a good idea because it 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 is a little bit behaving erratically and undesired. Okay, okay, yeah. that's good. that's the problem uh, we uh, sometimes observe with neural networks. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Okay, thank uh, you. I had a, uh, before I answer the questions that were addressed to me, I'm going to ask one question to Judith. Uh, what yes. and maybe it's it's a very simple question. The thing was, uh, what do you mean by the ultra weak formulation? I think I missed that part. Uh, yeah, we can call it weak because I only have one derivative, so you can integrate by parts or not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in so, this case, it's just weak. Yeah. So when is it going to be ultra weak then? Uh, for example, when you have a second order uh, equation with two derivatives and what we do in DPG is to reduce to a first order uh, system. So you have two equations, then you can choose to integrate by parts a uh, one equation or both. So when we mm -hmm. uh, integrate by parts, both equations, then uh, we say ultra weak there. So that's right. a, that was a, an abuse of the, of the term. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Judith. Thank you for the okay. clarification. Thank and you. Now I, uh, so uh, there are there were like a, a, a few questions uh, for me. So let me. So I'm trying to get them in order. So the first question was from Chris, and he asked me, does the transformation method minimize the error in the Brezis norm, or maybe a close by transformation? Uh, I think this is, yes, what we would like to see, <laughs> uh, but we haven't tested it yet. And this is what we are working on uh, to try to see if we can uh, minim, uh, This is what we would like to achieve. What we would like to achieve actually is to show that this uh, Brezis norm is maybe the best norm to consider for this problem. And what and um, what what our goal is actually, if we can, uh, so we understand where this uh, uh, norm comes from, uh, we can uh, interpret it in terms of uh, uh, kernels. And um, so this is what we are trying to, to, to show. And basically what was uh, surprising because it's actually very difficult uh, to, to deal with this norm because of the exponential that it has. Mm -hmm. But it does, when we do adaptation, it does produce uh, the best, uh, the best uh, adapted meshes. What I meant so with- this is what- yeah. Go. Go ahead. What, what I meant with close by transformation, that since you're essentially transforming a, a discrete mesh. So, yes. Oh. So that, that's what I meant with, oh, maybe either it, it, a close by transformation minimizes the error in the Brazil norm, or the actual transformation minimizes a 
discrete norm close by to the continuous Brazil's norm. Do you see what, what I mean? Maybe there's a not, different norm. Not clearly, not clearly. Since essentially you're, you're doing a, dis, a discrete mesh transformation. I, I wonder what norm are you minimizing then by doing that? What norm are you mean? Maybe that's the question I have. What norm are you minimizing? <laughs> Well, this is the question we would like to, but we would like to minimize this Brazil's norm. Actually, <laughs> that's that's uh, that's that would be uh, essentially our goal. I mean, this is what we want to clarify. And uh, there is a follow-up question by uh, Frederic. Basically, can you please comment a bit more on the method, which also has nice theoretical advantage of going back to uh, the Poisson problem? Uh, of course that would be the easy way to go. But we won't, don't want to do that because uh, we can find this uh, integration factor in 1D, but in 2D or 3D, we won't be able to do so. Our goal is still to be able to solve the, the, the classic uh, convection diffusion equation, but uh trying to find the best norm that we could be uh, using to uh, do the error estimation and adaptivity i agree but uh, what i was thinking is that in a multi-dimensional case this the, it's very difficult to have an explicit formula instead of this exponential of course yes but, yes but that that's that's i agree but but still there exists uh a, a function that uh, more or less solves the adjoint problem and when you that so that helps you transform the convection diffusion problem into this Poisson problem yes okay yeah do i understand i mean i'm not sure i understand the, then the question no the 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 the, 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 the what i mean is that the transformation to a Poisson problem seems to me generic and and it's it's still holds in in multi-dimensional case although the explicit formula of the prefactor will not be explicit in 2d right exactly no no you you can do it but you are not going to find it easily but maybe our goal will be eventually to, to try to find it and to try to find actually the, it comes to my question, can we find the optimal norm to deal with that problem? Then if we have a method to do so, can we find an optimal way to find the optimal norm for other problems? Hmm. And I'm thinking of, for example, the Elmot equation, but we, we, we still a work in progress. Thank you, uh, Frederick, oh, for your you. for your question. And then thank I you. had the last question. Um, uh, that was a question from Pedro, and uh, the Pedro was asking ideally, uh, ideally, compensating local error contributions to the quantity of interest accounting for the sign is optimal but extremely unstable. Do you think that it will ever be possible to cross on the mesh in zones where the errors have opposite influence in the QI? Well, no, <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't think uh, that would be possible. Still, we would like to find uh, because then, as you said, it's going to be very unstable. Uh, but still, we would like to find the best way, the best match that can handle this uh, these situations. I don't know otherwise. So I think, uh, so anybody has uh, another question? Uh, if not, well, um, thank you very much to all. Thank you very much uh, for the questions and uh, the discussion. Uh, I think we had very nice uh, presentations this morning. So the next session will be on uh, on Wednesday, as I said, and I'm going to wish you all a very nice uh, evening. I'm supposed to show you the program for tomorrow, just to remind you that the conference uh, will continue tomorrow. And uh, 
Let me uh, share my screen. Oops, if I can. Well, this is the program for tomorrow. It's going to start at nine o'clock uh, in the morning. So it will be a little bit early for me. Uh, so I will join you a little bit later during the day. Uh, otherwise, well, uh, thank you all for attending uh, the, the session and uh, see you tomorrow. Bye.